All right, well, good morning. I think most of you know who I am. My name is Raid Abdelhari. I'm one of the electric physiologists here. So today I will go over a hot and controversial topic in the EP community, talking about the Riyadh ICU. So as a background, uh, You know, today in, uh, the, we're going to review the background for the RIASA ICD recall, which, wa which was issued by the FDA in December of 2011. And I will discuss the suggested mechanism for this problem with the RIASA lead. I'm going to review uh, the available data on the RIASA um, ICD lead. And then I'm going to present the preliminary results for the multi-center study that uh, was initiated by Dr. Hauser uh, and was initially presented in the RIASA summit 10 days ago. And I will discuss some of the controversies regarding the screening and the management of the react lead. So in uh, December of 2010, St. Jude sent a letter to the physician acknowledging uh, that it had found some um, insulation defect in its react and react ST leads. Then there were some case reports and single um, center studies that reported externalized conductors for the react and react ST leads. Uh, most recently, in November of uh, 2011, um, St. Jude uh, Medical reported 0.6% incidence of all-cause abrasion for the RIATA and RIATA ST lead, with 0.1% incidence of externalized condu conductors. That's obviously based on complaints and uh, uh, returned uh, analysis by uh, St. Jude. Then the FDA on December 15 issued a recall for the RIATA and the RIATA ST lead, which was a class one recall. You know, this is a problem because there are still almost 80,000 RIATA and RIATA ST leads in use in the United States. So what are we looking at when we talk about externalized conductors? These are seven skinny pictures from a, a study that was published in the Journal of Cardiovascular Electrophysiology uh, in September of last year and showing seven cases that have externalized conductors. I'm not sure how easy it is to see them. But normally, all the conductors should be encased within the insulation, a certain insulation. You're not supposed to see anything outside the body of the lead. And as you can see here, there are some conductors here that are outside the body of the lead. And, uh, you know, it's easier to see them on some of the uh, pictures here. But I'm going to show you what I saw on the first fluoroscopy that I did on a patient with Riata lead here in this hospital. And I think it's very easy to see. To see these externalized conductors, which are, which are outside the body of the lead. And you see them here, you see them here. And this is a skinny picture, seeing that they have independent movement from the body of the lead, so they are outside the body of the lead. This was a very old patient, relatively old, that has uh, poor R waves, and we decided to add a new ICD lead, and this is the X-ray the following day. And we can even see it on an X-ray. This is just magnification of the X-ray. You can see the externalized conductor on the X-ray. This is a, a lateral view, and you can see the externalized conductors here. So how do the externalized conductors look in, in real life? This is a, a, um, an extracted lead, and as you can see, these uh, conductors, which have blue coating, which is a, an ETFE, ethylene tetrafluoroethylene uh, insulation, are just outside the lead, but you see it here, you see it here. So uh, in order to kind of explain the proposed mechanism for this pretty, very unusual form of lead failure, installation failure, I'm going to briefly review uh, the, um, the lead structure for the Riata and Riata ST lead. In 2002, um, the Riata lead was introduced to the market. That's an eight French lead. Then in 2005, the Riata ST, this is the seven French undersized lead, was introduced to the market. In 2006, the Riata ST lead was covered with an optum insulation, additional insulation on top of the silicon. In 2007, the Durata lead was uh, introduced to the market, and the Durata lead is the exact same lead as the Riata ST with a soft tip. The only lead that's currently offered by St. Jude is the Durata lead, and that has not been under any advisory, and so far we don't have any um, reports of any externalization on the Durata lead. I'm just showing the entire St. Jude inventory in 2000. So this is a cross-sectional view for the RIATA and the RIATA ST single coil lead. Here on the left-hand side is the uh, RIATA 8 French single coil, and here is the RIATA ST 7 French single coil. As you can see, both of them have inner coil with inner lumen. This inner coil is smaller in the 7 French than the 8 French. In the 8 French single coil uh, RIATA lead, 
there are two pairs of conductors that are placed in a lumen on opposite sides. These conductors have space around them. They can move within that space. It's not a very tight space, so it, it can move within that space. And that movement under mechanical stress can result in abrasion that starts from inside and goes out. So it's called inside-out abrasion. And this eventually can result in externalization of these conductors outside the, uh, uh, body, the, lead, uh, the body of the lead. Now, it's important to recognize that externalization is not the only way inside-out abrasion can manifest itself. Actually, in a report from St. Jude, um, although 85%, 85 percent, 85 percent of externalized conductors resulted from inside-out abrasion, only 15 percent of leads that had inside-out abrasion had externalized conductors. So, you know, if you don't see externalized conductors, that doesn't necessarily mean that the lead does not have inside-out abrasion. Now, in the seven French uh, lead, there are few changes from the eight French. First, because the inner coil is smaller, these conductors were brought closer to the center. That potentially can decrease this mechanical stress. Also, even in a single coil um, lead, there were three pairs of conductors. One of them is a dummy bear. And I was telling Dr. Hauser when my four-year-old daughter heard a dummy bear, she became interested in the Riata lead. <laughs> that reminded her of the, the gummy bear. But uh, anyway. Um, so this is, so they added this third pair to also decrease the mechanical stress. Interestingly, most of these externalized conductors are seen proximal to the RV coil, which is an area of high mechanical stress due to the movement of the lead across the fricasted valve. Now, as you also can see, these uh, conductors are covered by uh, another layer of insulation. It's ethylene tetrafluoroethylene insulation. And that's potentially why some of the, or most of the externalized conductors are still electrically intact. The reliability of these uh, ETSE insulation, though, is unknown. That's not what it was originally structured to do. Uh, it was supposed to be inside this silicon insulation. Uh, so this is the seven French Riata ST lead, and this is um, the Dorada lead, which is currently in use. And again, there's an additional optum insulation on top of the silicon insulation. Otherwise, the lead structure is the same. And the hope is that this optum insulation will prevent externalization. Now, Dr. Hauser presented uh, or actually published a paper in Heart Rhythm just last month. He reviewed the mode uh, database, which is a uh, you know, manufacturer and facility user uh, device experience database via uh, FDA. And uh, there were 105 reports of leads with inside-out abrasion. And interestingly, many of these leads had multiple um, defects, multiple insulation defects across the lead and under the shocking coil. So, uh, it's not a single area. It's multiple areas in many leads. And when the ETFE coating was examined in 50% of these leads, there was abrasion of this ETFE coating. And obviously, this, you know, when we talk about externalized conductors this, or malfunctioning lead, this can have significant clinical consequences for the patient. This is a patient who had noise on his uh, device and he had inappropriate shots. Now, I'm going to review uh, the initial single uh, center reports, whether published or, uh, in, a, in, the, in a journal or an abstract form. This is the German study from uh, Frankfurt that, was, uh, that I showed you the thin pictures from earlier. Um, they followed patients for a mean of 42 months, and the failure rate was, or incidence of failure for these leads was 8%. 30 out of 357 leads uh, failed in this study, which is higher than some of the leads that we use that are kind of the gold standard. Uh, seven leads had externalized conductors in this, uh, in this uh, series, and three of them also had oversensing, so three of the seven, and two had impedance changes. So it was not entirely a benign thing seeing externalized conductor in this series. Now, interestingly, for the overall lead defect, the median time to diagnosis was 29 months. For insulation defect, it was 51 months. So that raises the potential for time dependence. You know, or the problem is going to be worse down the road. We don't know that, but this is a, a, an important thing to keep in mind. Now, this is the abstract that was presented in uh, ESP just in, in Paris just last uh, summer, and uh, this came from Northern Ireland. And actually, they looked at 156 leads 
uh, that were in use in Northern Ireland. All of them were screened by fluoroscopy, and uh, 25 of them, 15% had externalized conductors, 15%. Five out of these 25 had also lead issues, electrical issues. That comes to 20% of the leads with externalized conductors. Now, St. Jude pointed uh, that 35% of this cohort had single, uh, single coal reality, the H French one. And 21 out of the 25 leads with externalized conductors were, were H French leads. So this potentially can suggest that the Riata H French lead can have more problem than the Riata SP lead. And again, um, there are some structural differences between these two. And clearly there were externalized conductors for the 7 French. But overall, it seems like the H French single pole is potentially more prone to that problem. Although, keep in mind that the Riata SP was introduced to the market later as well. So. And this is just the difference between the 8th French and the 7th French uh, uh, single coil. Again, the inner coil is smaller, so the conductor coils are closer to the, uh, the conductor, uh, uh, conductors are closer to the coil. And also, there's an additional pair of conductors that um, was added even in, in a single coil lead. Well, and the, this is from St. Jude uh, website. So this is the most recent letter uh, that they sent. And um, they reported 0.1% uh, rate of externalized conductors. But that's obviously dependent on the complaints and return product. This is much, much lower than what was reported in the Northern Ireland study. Uh, so based on the information available, the St. Jude Medical Advisory, Bo Advisory Board um, recommended to continue to monitor the REACTA lead while uh, they're conducting a prospective study looking at the externalized conductors. There was no recommendations at all for routine fluoroscopy or fluoroscopy at the time of a generator change to look for this external conductor. And um, there was, uh, they did not recommend any replacement of an externalized lead if it's electrically intact. Well, all that led to this multi-center study uh, that, again, Dr. Hauser initiated with seven centers involved uh, because we need more data. So, until this study, there was no independent multi-center data regarding the incidence of RIATA or RIATA ST lead failure, the signs of failure, or their clinical consequences. Also, the reliability of, uh, you know, an electrically intact external cable is, is unknown. And without this data, it will be impossible to design an evidence-based um, management strategy for your patients or um, to advise, the, uh, advise them on their risk if they have external conductors. So these are the goals for this multi-center study. Um, we wanted to compare the survival for the Riata and Riata SP leads to the Medtronic Quattro Secure lead, looking at all cause failure and electronic, uh, electrical malfunction. We also wanted to determine the lead failure rate and to assess the signs of Riata lead uh, failure and their clinical consequences. Uh, we also uh, aim to evaluate uh, lead performance in the presence of externalized conductors. So these are the centers that were involved, Beth Israel, Mayo Clinic, Minneapolis Heart Institute, Summa Cardiovascular Institute, University of Pittsburgh, University of Virginia, and Vanderbilt University. So this is a multi-center retrospective observational study. Patients were included if they were 18 years or older, and they had a RIATA or a RIATA ICD lead implanted and pulled at one of the centers. Data was gathered by each center and pulled for analysis. And obviously, each center had their IRB approval. A lead was considered implanted after the incision was closed. A lead failed if it did not meet its performance specification or otherwise perform as intended. Specifically, a lead failed if it exhibited one of the following. An abnormal impedance, electrical noise, increase in the pacing threshold requiring replacement of that lead, high defibrillation threshold requiring replacement, small R waves requiring replacement. Also, if a lead had externalized conductors, that was considered failure, even if the lead was functioning normally. It's for sure a structural failure. Now, function, on the other hand, functional abnormalities, such as exit block, physiological oversensing, were not considered failures, and lead dislodgement was not considered failure in this study. So leads that were removed from service were classified according to the Heart Rhythm Society uh, recommendation and the lead failures were reviewed by co-investigators at each center and adjudicated by the uh, study center. Survival probabilities were estimated by the Kaplan-Meier method with 95% uh, confidence found and compared using the long, uh, the long rank test. 
The Quattro Secure data uh, was obtained from the three center study for the Sprint Fidelity fleet that Dr. Hauser uh, published in circulation uh, last year. So between 2002 and 2008, there were 1,060 patients that received either a RIATA or a RIATA ST lead. 773 of them received the age range RIATA lead. The average follow-up for this cohort was 4.3 years. 287 patients received the RIATA ST lead, the seven French leads, and the average follow-up was 3.3 years for this cohort. Almost all patients had a dual cause uh, lead. Only 3% received single cause, which is important in the study. The average age at the time of implantation was 63.6 years. 74% of this cohort were males. Primary prevention was the reason for implantation in 77% of the patients. 59% of the patients had ischemic heart disease. 33% had non-ischemic heart disease. 4% had hereditary cardiac disease. And 4% of the patients received defibrillator for idiopathic ventricular arrhythmia. The average ejection fraction for this cohort was 28%. 21% had persistent atrial fibrillation. 45% received dual chamber ICD, 24% received single, and 31% received the BIV ICD. During follow-up, 27% of the patients received appropriate shocks and 30% received appropriate anti-tachycardia testing. Obviously, there was overlap. The ICD lead was implanted in the right, uh, in the right ventricular apex in 74% of the patients, and the septum in 26%. Interestingly, 8% um, of the patients who received Riata or Riata uh, uh, ST leads had an abandoned ICD lead at the time of implantation. Some of them potentially could have had a Fidelis lead, so they kind of got lucky. Um, 5% of them had uh, Pacer lead. Now, 5% of the RIATA leads were subsequently revised unrelated to any lead performance. That was either dislodgement or uh, perforation. 14% of these patients subsequently were upgraded. Uh, now, as of the fourth quarter of 2011, 70% uh, of the leads were active and functioning normally. 24% were removed from service for causes other than failure. This includes death in 222, transplantation in 11, perforation in 5, infection in 5, deactivation in 3, and other causes in 9. There were 62 uh, fa uh, lead failures in this study, which, represent, which uh, leads to 5.8% incidence of all cause failure. 45 leads had electrical malfunction, so the incidence of electrical malfunction was 4.2%. Seven of these 45 leads also had externalized conductors. On the other hand, externalized conductors with normal electrical function was seen in 17 patients. So 18% of the leads that were examined had externalized conductors, somewhat similar to the 15% that was uh, reported by the Northern Ireland study. Also, 29% of the leads that had externalized conductors also had electrical malfunction. This is higher than the general incidence for the entire cohort, which was 4.2%. This is a survival curve, curve uh, for the RIATA and the RIATA ST leads combined compared to Quattro. And as you can see, uh, the red uh, uh, here is the old code failure and the blue is the electrical malfunction. And the, these were both statistic, statistically significant with a lower survival for the RIATA and the RIATA ST leads. <laughs> When we looked at the RIATA and the RIATA ST leads separately, only the RIATA lead had a worse survival. These are the failure rates uh, for the different uh, leads. So when combined, the RIATA and the RIATA ST leads had 1.47% per year uh, failure rate uh, for all cause failure. For electrical malfunction, it was 1.06%. Looking at the RIATA, that's the age range uh, lead alone, the all-cause uh, failure rate was 1.7% per year, and the electrical malfunction was 1.2%. And as I said, the RIATA ST lead um, went, you know, had similar survival. There was no difference between that and the uh, quattro lead on, in this study. At least. So what were the signs of failure? What did they lead to? 23 of the leads that had electrical malfunction um, presented with noise or oversensing. This represents 51% of the leads that had electrical malfunction. This led to inappropriate therapy in 11 patients. 
uh, elevated thresholds were, see, uh, were seen in 15 leads. This resulted in syncope in one patient who was pacer dependent and lost capture. Abnormal pacing impedance was seen in 12 patients, abnormal high voltage impedance in four, decline in R waves three, high DFT in two. So as you can see, there are multiple signs for this lead failure, which makes things more complicated. Um, what are the limitations for this study? The retrospective analysis, and only 12% of the leads were examined for externalization. Um, many centers are doing active surveillance, so hopefully we'll have more data down the road. Um, most lead failures were not confirmed by return product analysis because they were not returned. And um, follow-up for the Riata ST leads was shorter than the Riata leads by an average of one year. So in conclusion, in this large retrospective study, the survival for the Riata, but not the Riata ST lead, was significantly lower than the Quattro Secure lead. However, again, the Riata ST leads had shorter follow-up. And our data suggests that externalized conductors are common in dual coal because most patients did have dual coal Riata leads. Uh, and uh, nearly one third of these leads that had externalized conductors were also malfunctioning. Oversensing was a frequent sign of, uh, of failure. Half of these patients who had oversensing on their lead had inappropriate therapy. But also impedance changes and threshold changes were common as well. We did in, uh, here we did send a letter to our physician and we're actively looking at, uh, at their leads. We're bringing them for us uh, skinny. As you know, the Riata Summit was held on uh, January 20 here in Minneapolis. And during the summit, uh, this study was presented. Uh, also, Dr. Ernest Plow from Northern Ireland updated the, um, you know, the Northern Ireland experience with similar data to what I just showed you. Dr. Kuhn presented the uh, VA experience. And there was a panel discussions on the management for and what to do with the Riata lead. And physicians just shared their clinical experience on the lead and showed um, some cases from their uh, centers. So I showed you our study. This is the VA study. Uh, in 2010, the VA Health Administration combined all their monitoring services under one entity, which is the NCBSC uh, uh, surveillance center. So this data came from that. And in this data, they looked at the Riata lead, the Quattro lead, the Endotec lead, um, and the uh, Fidelis lead. And these are large numbers, pretty large numbers. If you look at the failure incidence for these leads, it was 0.5% or less for the Quattro and Endotec lead. It was 3% for the Riata and 7.47% for the Fidelis. So based on this, the Riata was kind of halfway between the Quattro and the uh, Fidelis. And the difference was significant. This is the survival curve uh, showing the data that I just showed you. The green and the blue are the endotech and the quattro. Uh, this purple is the fidelis, and the red is the riata, and it's in between, uh, but it had poor, a worse survival than the quattro. Interestingly, in the VA uh, experience, the riata, the riata ST did not perform any better than the riata. They, they both were the same. Uh, this, this is also an interesting slide. Uh, 32% of the leads that did have non-physiological noise did not trigger transmission through the Merlin uh, system in St. Jude. So, so that was interesting to show. So hopefully I'm sure St. Jude is working on, on ways to improve uh, the sensitivity of that. So some of the points that were also discussed at the Riata Summit was a discussion on whether routine fluoroscopic evaluation is needed. We need to do it or not. Those who argued that uh, for it, argued that we do need to know whether the lead is, uh, uh, is, uh, has externalized conductors. The reasons are for patient counseling, uh, and also there has been some data that showed that leads with externalized conductors, possibly it's an association, but possibly have higher incidence of electrical failure. You know, in our study, it was close to uh, 30%. In the Northern Ireland study, it was 5 out of 25, which is 20%. That's much higher than 4.2% and can potentially affect the uh, the decision on what to do with the lead. Also, there was some concern about non-electrical complication from these externalized tables. Um, there was one presentation of a lead uh, that eroded. Uh, there, there were some reports on thrombus formation on these externalized tables. There was some concern about potential tricuspid regurgitation from these uh, externalized tables. So that's why people argue that we need probably to know about these externalized conductors and the extent of the externalization. I think almost everybody agreed that we need to understand the natural history of externalized conductors. 
Well, if we don't know they exist, we're not going to understand their natural history. We need to know that this cohort has external conductor to understand their natural history moving forward. Those who argue against uh, uh, fluoroscopy, uh, one of the arguments was radiation. And there was a very nice presentation during the summit. I don't know all the numbers. I'm not an expert. That clearly showed that this should not be an issue at all. Um, I think they said it's equivalent to an X-ray or, or two. So that's, that's it. <laughs> uh, also, um, there's an argument that we don't know what to do with the results. Well, I, I think as clinicians, there are many things that we see that we don't have a, like, a very clear knowledge on what to do with it, but it clearly incorporates in your clinical decision on what to do. And this is not, a, I don't think it's a cosmetic issue that now we don't need to know about, at least that's my bias. Um, also, there was some concern about the feasibility and the cost and other things, but I, I think in, for the purpose of this discussion, this is not something that I'm going to talk much about. Some of the challenges that were also brought during the Riyadh Summit is um, lack of full understanding for the electrical mode of failure. There were very, you know, various modes of failures, whether it's noise, whether it's threshold problems, impedance problems. There were some reports of uh, um, lead to uh, uh, TAN shortage with failure of uh, therapy. So I don't think we have a full understanding of the electrical mode of failure uh, for this for this lead. Also, as I mentioned, externalization is not necessarily the problem. It's one of the problems because inside out uh, insulation uh, or abrasion, I believe, is the problem, and not all of these standards uh, would result in externalized conductors. Also, one important issue is, that was brought up is that extraction is likely to be more challenging in these leads, and I'm going to uh, show why potentially that could be a problem. In the Riata lead, this one here, as opposed to Riata ST lead, there was no silicon back filling. So there's potential for tissue ingrowth between the coils in, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on these coils. And therefore, that makes the extraction more, more difficult. Also, the externalized conductors can present a challenge, especially when you're trying to move um, a sheath over these, uh, uh, these leads. If there are externalized conductors, that can present a problem. And many argued that we should start with a 16 French, which is a, a, a big sheath. That by itself can represent higher risk for extraction. Um, and uh, also many reported difficulty in advancing what we call a locking stylet into the lumen. That helps with the traction on the lead beyond the area of externalization. There were many cases that were presented during the summit that showed the problem. This is just to show you an extracted lead. And you can imagine how difficult it could be to advance a sheath that's just a little bit bigger than the lead over that lead, facing these uh, cables and this tissue. Now, I think there was some agreement that we need to intensify device follow on these uh, patients with externalized. Uh, uh. Now, how to do that, that was also a point of discussion. What's the best way to do it? And this is, I think, is a work in, prog in progress. I think reprogramming the device to maximize the ability to detect early signs of failure is important whether that's by tightening the impedance range that would trigger a device alert, or uh, by monitoring far field signals, because the problem, again, is not necessarily in the only sense field. A problem, it could be a high voltage conductor problem. And uh, also to store any electrograms possible so that we can look at them and not misinterpret them as an unsustained VT or something else. So we probably should reprogram these devices to minimize inappropriate shocks by prolonging the detection period for these uh, devices. And there was some discussion about a possible role for high output casing or synchronized high energy shock to, you know, to show a problem that was not uh, uh, seen before you do that. Um, and obviously the decision on what to do with the lead should be individualized. If there is electrical malfunction, I don't think anybody disagrees that this lead needs to be replaced. If you have externalized cables and the lead so far is electrically uh, intact, I think the decision should be individualized. If it's a, you know, 35-year-old hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patient that had three appropriate therapies, that's different than a, an 82-year-old who's here for gene change, who never used it. Um, also, at the end of uh, the summit, I think there was a, uh, you know, an urge, uh, you know, to clear need for better medical uh, device and lead surveillance and scrutiny by physicians, industry, and the FDA. Also, also, the issue of the Dorata lead was brought up. There are no reports so far of anything unique about the Dorata lead, but the Dorata lead is a newer lead. It has some similarities to the Riata lead, and I think it's important to have a, a form of a, a surveillance where we're able to detect low-frequency events that could down the road present a bigger problem. And at this point, 
uh, I think the uh, faculty and um, Dr. Hauser is, uh, the, is working on consensus statement for this summit, uh, so it's currently being prepared. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a consensus that uh, fluoroscopy is clearly the way to go. Just X-ray, this lead in, is moving. It depends on which part of the breathing or the heart cardiac uh, uh, cycle you're doing the X-ray. Um, many times, even on fluoroscopy, you don't see it unless you go from RA or LAO and look at it in motion. So I think uh, you can see it, and if you see it, it's specific. But X-ray is not a sensitive way of screening. Does the data include the uh, the No. Is, is there any data on that? Um, no. We don't have any reports of external life conductors or any data that shows any underperformance on the often insulated lead so far. There was one case that was presented on a Dorata lead that had external life con uh, conductors, but they should analyze that, and they thought that's from outside in installation, not inside out, so different things. I mean, the other thing, it seems that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the failures, there was no external So there must be some problem with the radiation where it breaks straight through, and I think it's very important that, uh, you know, even though it's a look so can't, you know, just externalize, I mean, it's a huge amount of time. Um, you know, that, uh, you know, if the numbers that we have both with larger series, again, we showed almost 30% electrical failure with external light conductors. That doesn't mean that the other leads don't have inside-out abrasion, but if you have potentially that extreme form of inside-out abrasion, are you more prone to electrical failure? So far, there's some association in, in our study and the Northern Ireland study and so forth. Yeah, there's really uh, points of my One in the RVOT all the way to the pulmonary artery, and that should.
The overspending was not the result of the shock rate. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the VA study, non physiologic noise only failed to issue an alert uh, in a person. That's, that's a real that's a real uh, So the question in our mind is if you put a uh, Medtronic device on that has that new system, will that be a better way to Okay, you have your group of patients now out there. But what have we done? I think we're, uh, and Dr. Gorney can also comment on that. We sent a letter to all our patients. We're bringing them all for uh, CINI. Uh, at the time when they come for CINI, they also get a device check. And uh, if there's any question of any abnormality, I think uh, either Dr. Gornick or Dr. Tang, they're in charge of, of doing this. They have the most experience looking at the leads. Um, they talk to the patients and individualize management. I know of one patient that Dr. Gornick told me about um, who uh, has used his device a um, few times appropriately. And as soon as he heard about this, he want, you know he has externalized conductors. He wanted the uh, lead replaced. And um, that's why I think we need to know patients are part of the equation, and you know it might be three, four years before we have full understanding. But we have to deal with what we know today, and we know some. It's not like we don't know anything. Um, I don't know, Doctor Gorin, if you have anything else to say on that. We have, we have actually a number of patients that have been able to No, that's that's exactly right. Other centers are doing that. I know in Pittsburgh, uh, where I trained, I mean, uh, I talk to them all the time. They're we're in much better shape. I think we have 120. They have a thousand leads uh, there implanted across their uh, um, hospitals, and they're bringing them on the weekend actually and doing it because they can't otherwise do it. Yeah. And I think we do six uh, in either in a half a day. That's what we've been doing. But still, if you have a thousand, that's a lot of half days. In Vanderbilt, uh, they reported 27 percent. Um, so it's been 15, 25. It's going to get worse. But you know, it's I, I again, I shouldn't say I know, but from what we know, it's not 0 0.1 percent. Because uh, <laughs> that's the number I can't compare to. Uh, okay. Any other questions? Thank you.